So good afternoon to you there and good morning from Brazil here. My name is João Pedro Maiato Pereira. I'm an undergraduate student in computational engineering at Federal University of Rio de Fora, Brazil. I'm going to present the study in arrhythmic risk within silico program ventricular stimulation and patient-specific computational models paper. So our contents here are going to basically be four introduction methods, results, and conclusions. So I'm going to start. Um, every 33 seconds, one person dies in the USA from a cardiovascular disease. That represents almost 30% of all deaths globally. So these alarming numbers emphasize our need to prevent the damages from the cardiovascular diseases. And one of these cardiovas cardiovascular diseases is the sodium cardiac death, the SCD, which is when the heart stops functioning properly. It can be caused by ischemic diseases, such as blockages in the arteries of the heart, or non-ischemic ones, which are related to the arrhythmias. So this, the arrhythmias, is where we're going to focus our study on. So basically, the arrhythmia is characterized by an, an abnormal heart rhythm. So the heart is controlled by a conduction system that sends out electrical impulses. This causes a heartbeat. When there's a problem in the system, this can make your heart beat too fastly, too slowly, or irregularly. And a, a cardiovascular disease that is strongly related to these arrhythmias is the dilated cardiomyopathy, the DCM, which is characterized by the ventricular changer chambers enlargement, as you can see in the image. Um, and it causes the heart contraction to be impaired. And it's also attached to another problem that is the reduced ejection fraction, which is when the, the, the heart chambers can't pump enough blood, can't eject enough blood to the rest of the body, which can lead to heart failure, arrhythmias, and potentially the sudden cardiac death. So the patients with dilated cardiomyopathy who are, who are at a high risk of death due to these arrhythmias have to go through an electrophysiological study called the program ventricular stimulation, which is when electrodes are inserted into the heart's cavities and stimulating for varying periods to evaluate the electrical propagation in the tissue and the possible induction of arrhythmias. After those exams, um, it can be constated if the patient will use the implantable cardioverter defibrillator or the ICD, which is a device that will monitor the heart rhythm. And if it becomes life-threatening to the patient, it will send out an electrical current to prevent um, death. So there's a need for more studies in the non-ischemic patient groups and a correlation with potentially fatal arrhythmias. So what we did here, we wanted to create a patient-specific computational models for the patients with non-ischemic um, DCM, the dilated cardiomyopathy, and a medical history of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. So it's basically like this. We have the magnetic resonance imaging of the patient, the MRI data, to evaluate the patient's arrhythmia risk. Then we proceed to create personalized computational models on these MRI data, in which we can proceed to do virtual simulations of the program ventricular stimulation. And by the end of it, we get a non-invasive stratification of the sudden cardiac death risk. Our methods. So our patient was a 61-year-old male who smokes with symptoms of fatigue and breathlessness when lying down. He did some exams and it showed dilated cardiomyopathy with an ejection fraction of 19%. Anything below 40% is already considered reduced ejection fraction. Um, he also showed non-sustained ventricular tachycardia which is when the heart has a very fast heartbeat. So we proceeded to do the MRI in the patient so to evaluate the morphology and the functional status of the heart. And it was showed presence of fibrosis. This fibrosis is associated with changes in the heart conduction system and possibly arrhythmias. And also the pattern shown in the patient's fibrosis is the same in the non-ischemic heart disease. So with that MRI data, we proceeded to segmentate, do the segmentation of the medical image using a software called SEG3D. As you can see in the image, the borders of the ventricles, the epicardium and endocardium are shown in green. And in red is the fibrosis of the heart. So we proceeded to create a mesh with that segmentation by discretizing the domain using a software called GMesh in which each element 
was marked representing the absence or the presence of fibrosis. The blue ones, um, blue color represents the fibrosis in the heart. Talking about the action potential propagation, um, basically when a stimulus is applied in the cell, it triggers the depolarization of, a, of the cell, which will affect the neighboring cells and propagate the stimulus. So our mathematical model, our idea was to model the electrical propagation of the heart. So in order to do that, we use the monodomain equation, which basically characterize the propagation of the action potential in the cardiac tissue via, via a diffusion partial differential reaction diffusion partial differential equation. The reaction equation, the, in the first equation, the left part represents the reaction and the right part, the diffusion. Um, it basically combines the effects of the ionic currents and the diffusion of the potential. And it has to be coupled to a system of all the ordinary differential equations. In our case, we, we choose the 10 tissue cell model that will describe the potential, the action potential propagation in the ventricular cells. And it has 19 differential or it has 19 ordinary differential equations. Um, so we chose the MonoAlg 3D for being the software that will carry out the computational simulations. It's basically a solver for the monodomain that applies the finite volume method parallelized in GPU. We use 70,000 volumes of the same size, 0.2 millimeters to the third. So the monodomain equation requires a solution of linear equations for each time step solved using the conjugate gradient iterative method. And the numerical solution is implemented in the Monog 3D simulator. So to run the simulations, we use the Saturn Cloud T4 X large for a coarse 16 gigs of RAM, one GPU. And the time we took to run each simulation took around 30 minutes. And we ran about 20 to 30 simulations because 10 of them were testing and correcting values. So we took about to 10 to 15 hours to run all of our protocol. And most of the time running one simulation for one simulation is by solving the ordinary differential equations other than the partial differential equations. So during the computation, computational experiment, um, we chose us, our simulated region was a two millimeter square because we wanted to simulate the use of a catheter. And we used this, we applied the stimulus right near the right ventricular outflow tract because it's the most pro-arrhythmic location. Also, the electrical conductivity is considered isotropic, which means that the electrical pulse is transferred, transferred evenly in all directions. Also, the Conductivity is heterogeneous, which means that the er areas where we had the fibrosis have reduced conductivity. So our program ventricular stimulation protocol consists of two main factors. Our main goal is to stress the heart, to check the arrhythmic, arrhythmic risk. And how do we do that? We do that by, by applying extra stimuli and a diminishing interval between those stimuli. So. In our protocol, we call the, simu the stimuli S1, S2, S3, and so on. And right below, we have the intervals between those stimuli. Our protocol follows this, this rule. We always start with eight S1 applications with a 600 millisecond um, interval between them. And all the stimuli after that, so the S2, the S3, and so on, follow on the same pattern in which we're going to start with a 380 millisecond uh, interval between those stimuli. And then we have to analyze three possible outcomes of those stimuli. Can be normal, block, or arrhythmia, in which we're going to talk about right now. Well, what if it's a normal one? If the stimulus had a normal outcome, it means that the stimulus can activate the neighboring cells in the region where it was applied. And after the refractory period, in which we can see right here, it will return to its normal state. And as you can see, blue, the blue color means that the cell is not activated. And the redder it gets, it means that the stimulus is being applied and being propagated. So as you can see, in the normal propagation, it respects the refractory period of a cell. That's why it's a normal one, and it can activate the neighboring cells. Our protocol says that if we have a normal stimulus, we get their interval reduced 
because our main goal here is to stress the tissue. So the closer we get to the ERP, the bigger the chances to um, induce an arrhythmia. What if it's a block? If it's a block, that means that the stimulus was applied to a region that it was still in the refractory period. So it's not able to stimulate the cells in its vicinity. As you can see in the GIF, the second stimulus is not able to propagate properly. Right there. And as you can see right here, there's a spike in the ERP, in the refractory period of the cell. We're in that um, red arrow is where we're analyzing the, there's a cell right there that we're analyzing the action protection propagation. And that graph shown right there um, shows us that the stimulus was applied when the cell was still in the refractory period. So it's not able to stimulate um, the cells properly. Um, the protocol says that if you have a block, the current interval is increased and we move to the next stimulus and follow the same protocol all over again. What if it was an arrhythmia? Well, the cells within the region of an arrhythmia are able to self-stimulate sustainably or unsustainably. In this case, as you can see, um, the arrhythmia is, um, can be seen in the simulation by the generation of a spiral wave of electrical excitation right there. And in this case, we got unsustainable um, spirals. As you can see, by the end of it, the spiral comes back to its normal state and the stimulus is not um, stimulated anymore. Um, the cell is not stimulated anymore, sorry. So if we have an arrhythmia, it's the same idea of, of the normal propagation. We get the interval reduced to increase the stress to the tissue. And when we get to an interval that's below 200 milliseconds, we stop the protocol. So in our application, the S1 application was all, were all normal during the S1. And in the S2, the first uh, interval we used already blocked. So following the protocol, we move to the next stimulus, which is going to be the S3. In the S3, S3, we got three different intervals with non-sustainable arrhythmias right before it blocked. And in the S4, we got five different intervals in which we got non-sustainable arrhythmias. And that um, 340 milliseconds interval is the one represented by the GIF, as you can see. So this study used 2D slices of the heart to model our tissue. So as you, can, as you could see, the tissue that we represented was a two-dimensional representation of the heart. And what we want to do next is to represent the three-dimensional study by taking many slices of the heart of the MRI data that we already have of the patient. And we can build a three-dimensional uh, model of the patient's heart and proceed to do a three-dimensional study that can give us more information um, about the patient. So the conclusions. Um, the arrhythmias were consistent with the patient's history because the patient had non-sustained ventricular tachycardia as shown in his, uh, in his exams. And we got unsustainable arrhythmias in our simulations, so it was consistent. We can improve the risk assessment. Um, we can improve the risk assessment by providing more information via a non-invasive simulation. And these are the first steps of a broader ongoing research project, as we already showed, so there is a lot to explore yet. And lastly, we can improve the patient outcomes because our final goal here is to better understand the mechanisms that generate the arrhythmias in patients with heart diseases. So this re research will help us understand and identify new targets so we can improve the clinical practice in cardiology and therefore we can improve the patient outcomes. So I'd like to thank your attention and that's it.